Hello, I'm Somi Aryan. I'm a tech philosopher and the founder of Impeak. My guest on today's podcast is Aaron McDonald, founder and CEO of Fluffbolt, which is a metaverse ecosystem of collectible NFT characters and a global creative community. But of course, they're doing a lot more than that. And I wanted to get an inside look for myself, which I share with you in this conversation. So let's dive right in. So Aaron, I heard about um, Fluff Vault initially from Hume, um, because those guys told me that uh, how they're using your PFPs, your your characters uh, for their music and Angel Baby. And uh, then one of our members also mentioned to me uh, that it would be great to have you um, on the platform and, and in general, you know, get get you in front of more of our um, our audience and members and uh you know, they mentioned you as one of the thought leaders in the space. So then I started taking a closer look at the project that you're working on, you know, Fluff World. And I think I'm going to come at this from a very beginner point of view and from an outsider's point of view, because I'm not yet in the ecosystem. Let's say, you know, I'm coming in and I want to understand what you're building. So, so can you tell me a little bit about yourself and then uh, tell me about Fluff World? What is it exactly? Yeah, cool. I mean, thank you very much for having me on the, on the show and kind words and big, up, big ups to the Hume guys. They're doing some awesome stuff with uh, Angel Baby and music in the metaverse. Um, I, my, so okay, a little bit about me. I've been in technology something like 20, 25 years now. Um, I started out in engineering and in the telecommunications and IT space and then kind of moved through into like more business roles and product development, product management, and then eventually kind of executive roles. Um, moving moving out of that into corporate venture and then um, from there into kind of startup land. I got into Web3 around 2015 initially and started playing with it. Um, and then in 2016, went full-time, uh, started a venture studio back then called Centrality. Um, and we started to incubate and accelerate and invest in Web3 companies and um with a particular focus on um, onboarding new users and um, solving some of the UX problems in Web3. Um, and so um, we kind of grew that portfolio out, got some really great technology out of it, um, and then started to look at where were the, the kind of user funnels that we could develop to bring people in to consume that, you know, that technology and those, those platforms. Um, and content, obviously, is one of those really key um, channels to bring users on. And so we started to do the same thing, incubate and accelerate companies that were building content-based plays. Um, and one of those companies was Non-Fungible Labs, who produced the Fluff World um, e- you know, collection and ecosystem and, and meta worlds. Um, so the Fluff World team um, have been really successful at developing high-quality um 3d content um and starting to build that into 3d experiences we've got a great um, community out there but it is one piece of um, what we've now called the futureverse um which is um about 11 different companies now that are either bringing technology or um, content um, together to create i guess a universe or a metaverse of um applications and avatars and um, services powered by this technology platform that's really focused on the next generation of Web3 users. Um, Taking all that research and development we did around um, the ideal user experience for onboarding new users to Web3 and then layering on top of this um, really great content that's come from Web3 um, and, uh, and increasingly now working with brands around the world to take their IP and bring it into the Web3 space using the same platforms and technology. So Fluff World is kind of the epicenter, I guess, of the content in the ecosystem. Um, it started out as a collection of um, 3D animated um, rabbit avatars. Um, and we were one of the first collections, I think, to bring um, you know, 3D animated um, PFPs to the market um, and um, and also dynamic NFTs. So one of the cool things um, you could do with your fluff early on was to um, change the 
background scene that it existed in and the music that went alongside it. Um, and so it was a music powered experience from the beginning. Um, and uh, music kind of gave your avatar a personality that you couldn't get in a flat, you know, two dimensional space. Um, and because you could um, change that whenever we would collaborate with an artist or um, have a new kind of social moment or cultural moment within the community that we could produce content for, people could like update their, their avatar, their, their NFT so that it could um, take on that new cultural moment or the personality of that collaboration. Um, and so we started to build this really great community around um, the fluffs. And since then we've, we've launched, I think 15 different collections um, that add layers of content to that world, um, whether that's um, companion characters, um, new kinds of um, uh, spaces or applications that people can interact with, like our mobile um, Burroughs application, which is like an Unreal Engine uh, 3D space for you to kind of hang out with your with your avatars and your buddies. Um, whether it's um, uh, kind of new layers of content for things you can start to do in those worlds, like our um, ray guns drop with the where, the team from Where to Workshop and Dr. Dr. Gorbatrops, um, or it's the Adam Car Club, um, with a bunch of um, cars that your avatars can race in so all of these different kinds of layers of content that we start to build up as a foundation for the next stages of world experiences and game applications okay so um when i look at your website you know in in the first instance what i see here it says that it's a metaverse ecosystem of nft character collectibles and a global creative community in yeah. principle, that sounds to me like um, a lot of other communities, uh, you know, NFT collections, communities. How do you differentiate other than the fact that you were quite early in building, you know, these uh, 3D characters? Is it is it in principle? Is it all about uh, these characters? Um, these, uh, you know, the, the um, is, is like, is it all about the story behind these um, uh, these yeah. products, do they have their own story? Like, uh, how, how, let's say, for example, if you were to compare this to, um, let's say, you know, any, any other, um, like that last year, there were so many, uh, of these mm. uh, types of 10k collections, let's say cyber brokers, for example, right? Like, you know, they had their own, uh, you know, these characters of, of the cyber workers. So then, then there's a story behind it. Is it similar to that? Is it like, you know, that there's a, a collection and then there's a story behind them? I think at the surface level, every collection is similar in a sense because they're all trying to build a community around content. Um, so when you look at, look at it, things superficially, then you see that um, similarity across the board, which is great. I mean, that's what Web3 content creation is about it's about building micro communities that are passionate about owning a piece of um, a content ecosystem um, I think where we're quite different is on two fronts um, first of all I think you know when I mentioned earlier that um, approach to building technology and infrastructure um, we're very very different to you know 99 percent of projects out there in that respect um, we've been doing that for five years we didn't just come along and build some pfps um i think um you know the ability to um, take your content and make it useful in different applications is the you know the thing that will create sustainable communities beyond what was you know a trading hype essentially um and so um, having that technology background, if you talk to anyone who knows our community or is around our community, you know, every time we release something, it's, um, it's highly innovative and it's, um, and it's pushing the boundaries of where the technology can go from a utility and usability point of view. Um, you know, a good example of this would be um, not long after the the fluffs dropped, we dropped these, um, these things called the thingies. You can see one behind me, it's a little spider here. Um, and um, these um, were a, a free connect collection to every, a um, collection dropped to everyone who had a, a fluff at the time. Um, the way those characters were created was we had 
um, an AI trained to paint 10,000 pictures. Um, and then we had a, a 3D pr process that picked up those pictures and turned them into a mesh for a 3D avatar. Um, and so each one of those um, spiders um, was totally unique and the, its fur, its kind of skin pattern was painted by an AI. And um, so then you got this 3D avatar, you know, um, animated avatar that was what was created by an AI. And then um, in the second phase, we enabled that avatar to create its own art. So each one is its own artist with its own um, brain and perspective on the world. And the users can go and create art um, from the perspective of their avatar. So that's one example of kind of the the deep tech that we get into in our ecosystem and uh, driving not just, um, you know, the kind of social social side of um, collecting, which is kind of the social proof of being involved in a community, but really driving that usability um, and, um, and taking it to that next stage of what everyone imagines the metaverse to be. We've got now no less than six different world applications in, in, in our ecosystem and games and development. Um, and so um, I think in terms of, you know, where we position ourselves, it's both on that kind of technology front and then on the kind of storytelling front, you know, one of the things that we've been really deliberate about is developing really deep stories and lore behind each of these characters and collections and worlds. Um, it's the thing that will make it a sustainable um, piece of content that can last years. Um, if you don't have that really deep grounding in lore and storytelling, then you um, you tend to fizzle out quite quickly and it starts to become uninteresting. Um, and, you know, the depth that the team has gone into this um, extends to the point of developing entire languages for some of these characters. Um, and so if I was to say, like, the things that set us apart, it's definitely that um, deep storytelling and lore and connectivity between all of the content in our ecosystem and the technology. We're definitely pushing the boundaries in terms of making the open metaverse a real thing for people to engage with. Okay, nice. Um, so you, you use the... And there are 350 people in the team doing this. This is not some like, wow, okay. you know, tin pot thing in the back of someone's office. This is a, this is a real serious you know, business. Enterprise, yeah. And you mentioned the word content a few times, um, but yeah. it sounds to me that you use the term content in a different way than what we normally think of. You know, when, when, when people say content, they mean content on social media. Um, mm. This It sounds to me that you're using the term content in a different way. Am I right? Yeah. I'm talking about kind of the broadest strokes um, because... When you look at what um, the metaverse is, or well, maybe it helps me to find my view of it first, um, it's just the internet progressing. You know, that's the simplest way to des describe um, what the metaverse is. And so um, that's one, one kind of element. The second element is it's the internet, but with um, user-owned assets. And those assets can be... Um, you know, your avatars, but they could be your identity, it could be your social graph, could be your communications, it could be the metadata about you. Um, and then the third thing is, is it's the concatenation of um, user experience silos that we once had. So instead of having to, um, you know, in the olden days, you would go from um, consuming media with a company or a platform to um, communicating with people on another with another company and platform. You'd have a telecommunications relationship and you'd have a media relationship. Um, and in fact, in the, in the early days, they were even separate, separate networks. They had their own infrastructure. Um, and then we started to see those things collapse. You know, the first step of the metaverse, if you will, was social media. It combined communication and media into a single user experience. And over time, the internet has been absorbing more of those things we used to do as silos into a singular user experience. So we started to get commerce coming into social media and we have social commerce. And we started to see finance coming into that stream with buy now, pay later. You didn't have to go somewhere to get finance. It was built into the 
um, purchase journey. Gaming starts to come into it when we start to gamify um, elements of commerce or elements of um, finance, you know, artifacts doing a really good job of gamifying commerce. And so this uh, metaverse is really the concentration of user experience from separate domains into a singular domain. So when you look at it, at the metaverse through that lens, then content applies to everything, you know, across the board. Um, where we've like kind of dialed in is we've picked like five channels, which we think are like the most important content channels to engage users with. Um, and then we've kind of built um, really great partnerships in each one of those content channels. So we've got mass market media. So that's kind of film and TV. Um, we've got sports, um, we've got music, we've got kind of celebrity and um, culture, and we've got um, uh, consumer goods, you know, fashion primarily. So in each one of those, we've gone and created like some of the best partners with some of the biggest brands in the world. And that's how we're addressing content is through each one of those channels. Okay, got it, got it. Okay, so it's a, yeah, definitely a very different view of how we would normally use the term content. So one thing you mentioned, you said that you launched 15 collections. Uh, what, mm. was, what was that experience like? Because I think one of the biggest challenges is releasing these different collections in, in this space because most of the time with every new collection that you release, the previous ones, uh, the holders of the previous ones, they um, they feel that maybe they are being diluted and they don't like it and they you know that so how did you manage that how did you navigate that yeah i think like it's important to to look at the, this through a couple of lenses one is that um if you want to create worlds which you know a lot of these pfp collections have been like oh we're going to create a metaverse well first of all you can't there's only the metaverse you can't create a metaverse um, the metaverse exists when we all collaborate to create like these open um, tools and projects and protocols that can interact with each other. Um, but let's say, you know, they're building a game, which is usually what they mean. In order to, to do that, you need depth of content in that experience. Otherwise, we end up with like really dull, boring places that no one goes and visits. And I'm not going to name any, but we can probably think of a couple and we've three off our head. Um, and so... And before you get to worlds, you need to layer up, you know, content in order to get to that, to get to an asset, in order to get to the point when people drop into worlds, there's, there's interesting things to consume there and do. And so, um, so when we look at building out these different kind of collections, it's about creating richness start for a start off inside of those environments where we'll end up. And one of the things you see within Web3 um, communities is that you're kind of on the inside of a product development process that you would normally just consume at the end of. So if I go and pick up any AAA title, you know, from the store, they've done all this work. They've created thousands of assets and, you know, lots of different like content items to go and make these world riches. And then you just go and consume them. But because we're on this journey with the community, we're building this together. Um, the, the, Pa the paradigm changes a little bit because they're inside that process as you're building out that richness. So that's the first thing. It's like important to have depth of content if you want to take people to, you know, worlds in, in your journey. You don't start with worlds because that's like a silly way to do things. The, um, the second thing is we want to make sure that um, we can leave room for people across that price value curve um, so that you can grow the community. Again, if you want to end up in worlds, you know, it's going to be a pretty shitty world if there are only like 10,000 characters and um, they're owned by 2,000 people, um, you know, and, you know, 10% of them are online at any one time. Like you want to be able to create a community that grows and grows and grows so that you can get to the point that um, that when, a, when you have those spaces, they feel alive. Um, and so... Um, what we've tried to do is create the ability for new people to come in and always add value to the ones who started the journey with us. I think we've been pretty successful at that. We're, we're currently, you know, one of the top three largest communities in terms of unique holders across our ecosystem. Um, and so, um, 
So we've been able to grow the community successfully and create value for people along the way as they come in. And even this kind of idea, I think, of um, dilution is is a very NFT 1.0 idea. Um, you know, if we actually think that um, the world will adopt this technology, we have to get beyond that notion uh, because only a certain segment of the population actually are interested in playing that game, that meta game, you know, the economic meta game, which you were kind of referring to there. Um, and you want to look after them and nurture them because they're the core of your community. Um, but that doesn't mean necessarily that um, you have to um, make that a viable proposition for everyone who enters the community. Some people just want to be there to enjoy the content and play the game. In fact, I'd like to put a challenge out there if, if um, you're making content that is primarily for trading, you're probably not making good content because we want to make content that people love, that they want to own forever, you know, that they treasure, that they want to kind of build up. Um, and you can see that actually in a lot of our um, statistics within the ecosystem, we constantly are in the lowest, you know, on sale portions of our collections because people collect these assets and they they hold on to them because they love them that's in general right now i feel like the the nft space and the web3 space in general is um primarily driven by traders which is very unhealthy and mm. um, it, it makes it really hard like as a founder myself you know and especially in in our case we are building an educational platform education mm -hmm. networking right so like a professional networking right so mm -hmm. you know that's why we compare ourselves to linkedin and mm. masterclass and um it's so hard to get people to see it that way and not think about just you know like we minted our nfts about 11 weeks ago uh, at mm -hmm. uh, our Genesis Pass at at the time at 0.1 uh, ETH, uh, so mm -hmm. quite low. And now it's sitting around one and a half to two ETH. And, mm -hmm. and it's so hard to get people to like see beyond the fact that the value of the NFT is going up and actually just stick with it and learn and, you know, educate. And it, yeah, and, and it's, out, it's honestly, yeah. it's the space is, it's the fault of the, the entire industry because... Um, it's been hyper focused on financialization of everything, and it's it's not a fault of crypto. It's actually just a symptom of you know the broader economy. We you know it's just that you, crypto has the unique property of being able to make attention a liquid asset. Um, you know, in the rest of the economy, everything is also being hyper financialized, um, but um, with the crypto um, attention itself can be made a liquid asset. And because of that, it's led to um, a large part of the industry being focused on the financial aspects instead of creating, you know, useful products. Um, and so um, what we've been really focused on is how do you create magical user experiences that create, that give users something they couldn't do before. And, um, and make that experience of coming in and joining the space about that con that content experience and about the thing they can now do that they couldn't do before, as opposed to the financial aspects of it. Um, not to say that that other stuff isn't important because it is, because that's what kind of bootstraps and fuels the um, the ecosystem. It's just it's just that your your kind of focus for adoption beyond that has to step out of that mode and say, okay, well, those people will keep looking after them and creating value for them because they need to keep playing that economic metagame because that's important for the ecosystem. It's an engine for it. But actually, there's a whole segment of users out there that don't care about that. They just want to come and do some cool shit. Um, and so if you can segment you know, the users properly and give them the right user experience and give them a good reason to come and do something cool and fun, um, then you can have the best of both worlds. You can have the people that are interested in playing the metagame of the economy getting value out of that and they'll get more value out of it by you know these other this other user segment coming in and driving real cash flows as opposed to what we have today which is kind of like money go rounds um and so um so that i think both can sit side by side but we have to make a concerted effort as an industry to to put the product experiences in front of the everyday person that are just about 
a cool product experience and not about the financial aspects of it. But do you think that as those everyday cool people that we are talking about that, that want to have cool experiences, mm-hmm. do, you th- do you think that as those people come in, that they are they are also going to become like the other ones that are already there here now. And like, you know, a lot of the people, like, you know, the space turns you into a DJ. Even if you're not a DJ, you know, you go into uh, these Discord channels. Some people, yeah, some people. Yeah, but I mean, I think- I just worry that we are are opening a floodgate of- uh, (laughs) I get what you're saying, but the I think the next generation of consumers possibly won't even engage in that that world you know we've got um tens of thousands of people joining up and signing up for our fifa world cup um ai league at the moment that aren't from web3 they're just coming in and playing that game experience Mm -hmm. now there's a flow on which benefits the people who were you know early in in the um, nft ecosystem um but those people are just playing the game they don't even probably know that this other world exists. Um, and so I think that as you scale users, the, no- the noise ratio of, you know, people who are interested in that metagame versus people who are interested in the product, you know, that'll change. Uh, if I, we build I, I, great I products. So. Yeah, know? exactly. <laughs> uh, first of all, yeah, I hope so. Because I think part of the issue with the tradability thing is that what it has done it has it has created um, an environment where people essentially are putting out just these images and and like saying that they that there's a story behind it and and then they uh, it's basically just like the ICO craze all over again but with a picture. So now in this world where we are we want to focus on you know building great experiences and 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 these storytelling etc why do you think it's necessary to use N- um, nfts in the se- sense of you know tradable nfts you know do you think that if these ter- nfts were not tradable if they were soul bound uh, for example tokens I, I really like soul bound tokens and like i said we are we are mm-hmm. releasing our soul bound tokens um next week uh and uh they are going to be programmable they will, you know, based on your engagements. So first of all, from the time that you mint it, each NFT will be uh, valid for one year. And then after that, you need to renew it. But when you renew it on on Etherscan, we will teach you how to renew it on Etherscan. But when you renew it, because the NFTs are dynamic, based on your level of engagement, you go to level one, level two, level three, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But based on the level that you have unlocked, uh, you will get your next one at that amount discount. So let's mm-hmm, say if you mm-hmm. got to level two, you get four, four, 40% discount. If you get, mm-hmm. got to level uh, four, you get 80% discount. If you got to level five, you get full, like you get your next year free. Um, you know, mm-hmm. and, and this is one of the ways that we are kind of like creating these engagement programs. Um, and uh, that's what I love about tokens. I think tokens are so interesting. Uh, there are so many possibilities of uh, programming incentives and incentive, um, you know, models, but I don't necessarily think that they need to be tradable. I think the tradability really complicates it. I think it's a good point, but my sense is that there's room for, for everything. You know, tradability is important in certain scenarios. Like a really good example, if we kind of take like, a proto metaverse like um world of warcraft for example like you can go and collect items there and put them in the marketplace and you know sell them or trade them to other people in your community or your guild or um you know friends you meet along the way um and that's an important part of the crafting economy in the game without tradability you wouldn't get that um and so i think um saying that tradability um and its essence is bad as as a as a wrong way to look at it. Also, tradability as a primary driver isn't bad for certain kinds of things. You know, we've had trading cards for a long time. You know, in um, in the two D economy, you know, the 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 meat, the meat space, um, and um, that's been a you know a hobby or collect, you know thing that pe- collectors have engaged with 
over time that brings a richness to that collecting experience. Um, so, so tradability by itself isn't bad either. Um, but I think um, if if everything is designed around the notion that um, trading is the primary activity, then we're we're missing a beat. Um, and um, and in fact, I kind of want people to look look past the technology a bit more. Um, you know, the idea that um, we're going to get you know a large portion of the world's population engaging with um, you know some you know definition of a um, database standard, um, which is what an NFT is. Um, and really care about that is kind of silly in my mind. You know, imagine um, you were signing up to e an email account and you had to understand that it was driven by the POP3 protocol and what that meant. Like, it just shouldn't be in front of people's minds. Um, there'll be an interested, you know, nerd community that gets into that. But the majority of people, we should just be um, bringing them up a layer and saying, hey, here's this like cool thing you can do. Not here's an NFT, you know, it's like, well, here's this cool experience you can have that you couldn't do before. This is this community you can be a part of. This is a new way that you can like own content. Why NFTs are important and uh, the thing that makes them the kind of foundation of the open metaverse is what I mentioned earlier, which is the open metaverse doesn't exist without user ownership, right? So we talked at like the previous economy, digital economy was built around user generated content. The metaverse economy is built and generated around user owned content. And this is the defining characteristic of the, the open metaverse versus, you know, the internet today. And so NFTs are the mo, you know, the mechanism to deliver ownership. But actually ownership is the product feature that we need to talk about with people, not NFTs. Don't talk about the delivery mechanism, talk about the product, you know, value proposition. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you. But you know what? Um, I think that tokenization as a whole is going to be everywhere. There's going to be so yeah, like it already is. is. Yeah, yeah. And but it, yeah. it's gonna be like so much more like let's say instead of having a normal membership, you would have a token. Now that token may be uh, you know, a, a, a ERC-21 token, or it may be a soulbound token, yeah. or maybe, you know, ERC-20 token, but like tokens are going to be ever, everything is going to be tokenized. When I look at the future, you know, as a, uh, as a tech philosopher, as somebody who looks at, you know, the philosophy of money, the philosophy of technology, the philosophy of, you know, politics, etc. I or when I see that, uh, I see that tokens are going to be everywhere. And um, because they are programmable, uh, you know, they're programmable way of uh, exchanging value. And because they are programmable, I think we are going to come up with so many new ways of creating tokens that will be beyond the type of ERC-21 tokens that we have right now that are tradable, that are tapping into your dopamine uh, response with this tradability thing to a point that you, you can't see past beyond that. It, you can't see, you know, like that's why I think for us being a, an educational platform, it probably makes more sense for us to be a, so to have soulbound tokens so that people just just don't think about floor price and just mm, focus mm, on you know on learning and education and and uh, networking and all that stuff. Yeah, I think I think that's a really smart use of um, tokens and framing it in a way that takes it outside of the the um, economic meta game and to, and focuses people on the value that it's creating and 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 you're right, like you know, and I would go a step further to say that the world is already heavily tokenized it's just that the tokens for things sit behind the scenes you, know, you own shares in a company those are tokens you know you, you consume units of electricity those are tokens it's just they exist on private databases you know spread around the world and all we're doing is like lifting the visibility of those um, existing tokenized ecosystems into a space where that can be transparent and programmable like you said um and 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 reinforcing the earlier point and owned by communities you know that's or, or users that's the kind of um paradigm change is not the tokenization because that already exists it's it's making them transparent you know making them programmable and making them um ownable that's what that's what this technology does 
So the ownership is the most important part of this. When you look at, you know, the type of metaverses that we are building, the experiences that we are building, how do you see this ownership translating into, I don't want to say necessarily marginalized or underserved communities, but more like maybe third world countries or like, you know, places where, okay, let's let, give you an example. You know, I, I grew up in Iran. I was born and brought mm-hmm. up in, in Tehran mm-hmm. during the Iran-Iraq war. When I mm-hmm. learned English, um, I, you know, I started reading books in English. It opened a whole new world um, you know, in front of my, my eyes. And yeah. I realized that there was a world out there that I didn't know, that I couldn't see, that I didn't have access to. And through these books, I, I started reading these books in English, uh, uh, like novels. And, and I was able to imagine these worlds that were, that were outside yeah. of what I could experience. How do you see that? Uh, playing out in 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 a world where we can uh, create these visual uh, experiences and and could it be that if you live in some of these areas that you can't have access even to that kind of metaverse experience mm-hmm. you know, we know already for example that um, say uh, open sea uh, did not allow some of the say Iranian artists to uh, you know to have a mm-hmm. there. so so do you think that this is going to continue into the metaverse and and or is there a way that uh, the metaverse can open up new experiences for those parts of the world yeah I think it I think like if we it depends on the time scale we're in this kind of I guess called messy middle where um, there's a clash of systems you know we've got this and it's not the metaverse or web three so much as it's like digital society versus like our traditional historical society. Um, in the historical society, everything was physical bound. And in fact, like the main reason to have governments was to protect physical property rights, probably still is the only real reason to have them. Um, and, um, and as we move forward and more and more of society becomes digital um, and the things we value become digital, those that that system is no longer relevant but we're in this kind of like clash of you know of the ages between the with transition and the metaverse is just kind of um the next form of that digital society so as we move f- further and further towards that i think those kinds of um historical you know definitions of of um of societal groups or populations that are bound by physical things like the country you live in will become less and less. They'll become less strong. They'll become less important to people. And therefore, eventually governance, you know, will reflect that. And so we'll move from our constraints that are kind of bound by those physical things today to things that are more aligned to the, to the more liquid nature of the internet. So that should level the playing field somewhat for people around the world. I think also, um, the interesting thing about production of value um, in our societies today is that a lot of it is also geographically bound because it's tied to physical resources. You have to have you know, enough people to create like a factory worker economy. You have to have enough um, metals to create uh, or you know, um, primary resources to create a mining economy. You have to have enough... Um, energy resources to create an energy driven economy if you kind of map out the world's um economies they're all driven by what's like physically in in the ground um and also by the kind of dynamics of labor in those markets um if we if we kind of push forward further um and um you know we see more and more automation happening in the production side of things um you know those some of those kinds of constraints um, start to dissipate. And if more and more of things we consume are digital, then some of the kinds of physical production, um, you know, dependencies dissipate. And therefore you have a much more level playing field because there's no um, boundary or advantage um, to being in a specific part of the world or coming from a specific population when it comes to creating stuff in the digital world. And so um, we, I think we can have a more, um, a fairer chance for people to uh, participate in a global creative economy that is driven by 
um, primarily by thing, creating things in the digital space. And I think if you like draw a long enough bow um, and we say that um, automation progresses to the point that most of manual labor becomes irrelevant um, and, you know, we can get food production, you know, working at scale in factory environments and those kinds of things, um, then the only economy that will really exist is the creative economy. Um, and so um, in that world, I, and in, in a society which is primarily digitally bound and not, you know, physically bound, um, that the opportunities for people who have been marginalized in the past start to kind of e expand or the barriers start to dissipate. Yeah, no, super interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, fascinated by how this is going to change, especially because like right now we are hiring people from parts of the world uh, that um, traditionally it would be quite hard uh, to to hire from because you know we can pay them in crypto you know and they can and they yeah that's a, that's another that's another tethering thing right previously we in order to get access to the financial system we were tethered to physical banks you know that existed on in the meat space um, and the only way you could access financial the financial apparatus was going through these physically domiciled banks. And so when we can make, make a bank universal, which is what, you know, something like Ethereum does, um, then, um, then that constraint is now gone for the people who were, you know, underserved or, um, or locked out. This has been super interesting. Um, last question. As you're creating these worlds and, you know, as somebody who is like really deeply involved in, in building the future metaverse, um, do you think that these technologies are making us uh, more connected uh, and less alone or are they making us more alone? You know, like I... Uh, I just look at, you know, the way that I'm working right now, I feel more connected than ever because, you know, like I'm, I'm so deeply connected to our community. I, uh, I, I feel really connected to names of people that I see every day on our discord. And I wonder, like I wake up in the morning, probably the first thing, you know, maybe subconsciously comes to my mind is, oh, I wonder how, you know, Bulldog is doing or, you know, like Lotta is doing, you know, on, on our Discord, right? In a way that I don't necessarily think the same way about my real life friends, you know, unless like I'm meeting them that day or something like that, you know, like, like these, uh, these worlds are becoming so real. It feels so real. And then I feel like, if that's how you feel towards a name with an avatar um, on a Discord server, how much more <laughs> real that's going to feel when you're seeing this animated character in a more 3D environment and you're, you know, like you're going there every day and you're connecting in this world and, and like, running around with their with your friend's avatar in the metaverse you know <laughs> right like um so yeah so in yeah. general do you feel like we are as humans we are more connected or less connected i mean i think the technology could drive both outcomes like technology itself is generally agnostic to these kinds of things um i kind of say i go a step further and say that um the distinction between the real world and the you know, the Discord experience is none. There's no distinction. It is part of the real world in the same way that if it was your real life friend messaging you on um, Instagram or whatever, that's that's the same thing. You know, what's the difference there? Um, and, um, and we kind of can't divorce ourselves from this digital world anymore. Like the notion that they're two separate things that, exist independently is already gone i mean this here you know is turning you into a a cyber has turned you into a cyborg already you're connected to the internet all the time and in fact if you took that away from you know most of the population we society might start to crumble you know um and so um i think this kind of 
notion that we're separate from technology as a society and as species is is wrong. It's just part of our society, society and it is part of our real world. Our reality includes that. Um, you know, the the opportunity that the technology gives you is to create more connectivity. Because again, you previously you were bound by physical constraints. You know, way back when it was whoever you could walk to, um, you know, in in your entire life. That's that was your that was your societal, you know, pool of connectivity. And then it became like whoever you could ride a horse to, and then it became like who whoever you could like, you know, row a boat to or whatever it was. Um, and so over time we've just increased the pool of people we can be connected to. And like you mentioned earlier, you know you were trapped inside of a, a bubble, right? And then you st- you got the opportunity to step outside of that and discover a whole bunch more connectivity. And so what the internet has done, in, done for us and what immer- more immersive spaces will do us is provide more opportunities for connectivity with more people, um, for people to express themselves in a way that they may not have felt comfortable doing before or... Um, and there's a, there's a bad side to that equation too, by the way. Um, but... But um, but the opportunity exists for more connectivity. Whether we individually take advantage of that will come down to like you know decisions those people make, and also to a certain extent, um, you know, creators in this space and leaders in this space have to think about the Black Mirror episode of what they're building. It's a good product thought experiment to go through, and if you're building a product, I'd like really encourage you to run a workshop on on the Black Mirror episode of your product. And think about like what are the negative consequences of the thing that you're doing, um, and try and figure out how you can, you know, put things in place to try and prevent those negative consequences from happening. I do think that we, in general, we tend to romanticize the past. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. always yeah. it's always like that. We romanticize the past, and we are like, oh, it used to be better. We used to go out yeah. more. You know, we used to do things. But um, yeah, it's just different. But why? Right? But why is that objectively better? It's not. Yeah. It's, it's just different. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, no, this has been super interesting. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, so, what's next for Fluffold? What's uh, you know, twenty twenty three? What does it hold for you? Where Where are you going from this? Well, twenty twenty three is the year of the rabbit. So, um, is it? We've got, uh, I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a lot of stuff coming next year. We've got, um, you know, huge partnerships that we'll be announcing with, you know, some more of the what I think are the leading kind of uh, brands in those categories that, that I talked about earlier for content. Um, we've got um, new applications coming to market. We've got the Root Network, which underpins our ecosystem, kind of launching fully. Um, we've got the third kingdom trailer launching soon and we'll be launching the first um, kind of zones for people to write, come and come and play with next year. So it's going to be a huge year for fluff world and the future verse ecosystem. Amazing. And you mentioned that you have a, a pretty big community. Have they stayed quite active to, throughout this um, bull market? Yeah. Uh, sorry, bar, not bull market, the bear market. The bear market. And, yeah. And, and uh, like how, how big is your active community? Yeah, so across the um, Futureverse ecosystem, I think there are just over 25,000 active unique wallets. Um, And um, while I think everyone's seen a drop off in engagement overall, I've been been very um, pleased with the fact that our community has stayed pretty active. Um, And I think that comes back to that earlier point around depth and content and, you know, being able to like step beyond the the social validation part of NFTs into something that is a little bit more kind of that is deeper and more immersive. Great. Well, thank you so much. I look forward to having you again uh, in maybe six months to uh, or whenever you have something new coming up. Right. Yeah. So, cool. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Love to come back. Would love to have you on the platform as well. So we do these things called NFT insiders where mm-hmm. you come in and do something about a specific topic that you are known for. And you mentioned a yeah. lot about deep tech and, and how yeah. you're, you're using, you know, deep tech. So maybe you can yeah. come in and do a, a, an educational session on that. Okay. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Thank you so cool. much. Thank you.
I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Aaron McDonald of Fluff Vault. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it on Apple, Spotify, or any other one of your favorite podcast channels. And don't forget to give it a five-star rating and write a review. The full interviews are also available on my YouTube channel, The Somi Ariane Show. <laughs>